Inside Colorado is uh, here with the Assistant Commissioner, Ernie Derhera. Uh How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks, Tom. Uh, we are interviewing him on the girls' wrestling, uh, which is uh, attempting to be a sanctioned event uh, within two years, or actually uh, within one more year, because this is a pilot program. Uh, tell me what your goals are for setting up uh, women's uh, wrestling or girls' wrestling in the state of Colorado. So, you know, we started probably three or four years ago when I was uh, the chair of the wrestling committee and I was still an athletic director um, at Thompson Valley and at Frederick. Um, and we had been talking about um, bringing girls into the sport. We knew that the girls were out there, um, particularly at the youth levels. We saw a lot of high, uh, numbers, uh, but middle school numbers you saw a big drop, and then high school numbers you saw a bigger, even a bigger drop. So. Um, we knew that there, at the time, there were six states that had sanctioned uh, girls wrestling. Um, we felt like, uh, and when I say we, it was uh, me, uh, Harry Waterman, who was the assistant commissioner at the time, and uh, we actually put together a uh, girls committee. Uh, Doug Fowl, whose daughter Cody uh, qualified for state tournament, I think, three times with the boys uh, from two different schools. Rich Fell, who's a... a an official uh, who was uh, interested in also promoting the girls' side. Uh, Coach Randy Gallegos from Denver East, who coached uh, Maya Nelson, who uh, had a lot of success with the boys. Um, and uh, Ty Tatum here at Mead High School, uh, who is the region's uh, representative uh, for the National Wrestling Coaches Association. So as a subcommittee, uh, we got together in November of 2015, and we uh, wanted to uh, explore what it would look like if we offered some girls-only tournaments. So um, I was at Frederick at the time. We opened up a girls-only tournament in conjunction with the uh, Warrior Invitational. Uh, we brought in 19 boys teams, and we brought in, I think it was 84 girls from 41 or 42 different teams uh, to wrestle in the girls' only invitation. Uh, pretty successful, uh, bigger bigger than I expected it to be. I expected about 50, 60 girls, so we, we did quite a bit there. Um, now, and it's just uh, grown from there. Right. So Now taking a step back, uh, with the uh, six states that offer girls only, uh, within the last four years, or actually within the last two years, uh, mainly there's been a push for girls only in a lot of the hotbeds of wrestling. Uh, now it's up to 14 uh, sanctioned uh, girls only, uh, where the girls have to make a choice uh, uh, that they have to be on a girls only team or they can't wrestle. That's so what are the standards are you looking for in Colorado? So, you know, when we started that stuff early and then we got an official recognition as a pilot program, as you know, for this year and next year, um, what we were trying to do through this four-year period is build towards sanctioning at 2020. That's always been our goal, is, is to be sanctioned by 2020. Uh, knowing that when we got to 2020, um, the girls would have to follow a very strict set of standards just like the boys do. Um, and so we're using this pilot program to help us massage any rules and differences that, that we're going to see with the boys. Because, like you said, when, once it is fully sanctioned, um, there are going to be some of those rules that are in place where if the school offers a girls program and offers a boys program both, the girl has to wrestle with the girls program. That's federal law. That's federal standard. Um, that, so that's not a Chassa thing, that's not a State of Colorado thing, uh, that's basically coming out of U.S. code. And so um, what we're looking at, there might be some districts that decide, uh, so I know like Cherry Creek School District right now, the Cherry Creek School, uh, there's girls that want to wrestle, they all wrestle at Eagle Crest, that's where they house their district team. So it's a co-op program. Well, it, it could be co-op, so when you use the word co-op, it's, it's, it's a little tricky when you look at Chassa because um, you have two things. You've either got a co-op program where 
schools band together officially and share costs, or you just have a program such as when I was at Thompson Valley, where we offered boys and girls lacrosse. Were we the only school in the area that did, so other schools were welcome to come to us, they didn't share those costs. So it was a Thompson Valley team, whereas in a co-op program, it's a shared program. So uh, it depends on how you... And, and for girls wrestling, it won't matter much, because um, when you do a co-op, officially you have to combine those enrollments to give you your classification. We expect girls wrestling to be one classification for the next several years. It won't be big enough for so one or two classes for a while. So, um, we do expect, though, that, that girls will have to make a choice. You know, um, uh, If they want to wrestle, they're going to have to wrestle with the girls' team if their school offers it. If their school doesn't offer it and their district doesn't offer it, this district's not offering a district team, per se, uh, then you've got a choice. I can either travel to a nearby school that offers girls' wrestling and compete there, or then federal law allows you to compete with the boys' team. Okay, because uh, I know this year we have uh, a few girls that are opting to be on just the boys' team. There are 12. There's 12 girls, that, okay, that are uh, wrestling on the boys' team alone and not participating in, some, in the girls' only yeah. tournaments. Uh, at least in the postseason. So there's, there's 12 girls who uh, have made themselves, declared themselves eligible for the boys' postseason. Um, we've actually got three of them that are ranked at 106 pounds in the uh, uh, 3A classification, and uh, I think it's more than likely that one of those three girls, if not more than one of those girls, has a very good chance of, of placing this game. So, um, so, so this year and next year, girls will still be eligible to wrestle boys or girls throughout the season. And then at the end of the regular season, they'll have to make a choice. I'm either going to declare myself eligible for the girls' postseason or declare myself eligible for the boys' postseason, but they won't be able to wrestle at all. Once it's sanctioned, you're going to be one or the other. Most likely, you're going to be girls, unless, again, like I said, your school doesn't offer that program or you choose to wrestle at least. Uh, this year, being a pilot program, there are two regional tournaments. Uh, looking at the numbers, they're running about 100 to 110 in each region. Yes, sir. Um, how are those numbers compared to what you thought they were going to be at? So when you look at the number of girls that we actually have certified in track wrestling, uh, we were right around the 300 mark. Uh, for whatever reason, um, girls found they didn't like the sport and they quit. Uh, they were injured. Uh, they were ineligible, or like I said, the 12 that declared for the boys. Uh, we, we lost about a third of those girls. We're down about 200, which is uh, uh, 210, but that's a little bit lower than what I expected to be at this point in time. But it's not concerning to me because, again, our, our, our actual numbers of girls that uh, uh, are certified uh, in track wrestling is up about a third from where we were last year. But I just expect those numbers to go. Now, setting up the uh, regional tournaments and going to a uh, qualifying that you move four uh, wrestlers on to a state tournament, uh, how is that format uh, looking? So, it was, um, it was something that was discussed by uh, Vince Massey, who's now the current chair of the wrestling committee, um, and Sparky Adair, who's the Eagle Crest coach. They are the two that actually represented uh, girls wrestling at the board of directors meeting last February. So I worked with the two of them, the three of us, come up with our format. And we thought that we knew it was important for us to get to a point, like you say, that where we had qualifiers to get to the state tournament. Um, we that felt like that two regions where they qualified for was probably going to be the best for us because an eight wrestler tournament, eight wrestler bracket is something that you can actually complete fairly easily in one day. Um, and we did not expect uh, to have the total number of girls available to constitute more than two regions. So eight was an easy place for us to start. Looking at what we have, in most cases we have anywhere from seven to 16 wrestlers um, in brackets here at the regional tournaments. So four seems to be the right number for a 16 uh, person bracket, just like the boys are. And that's, and that's kind of what we based it on. 
Okay. Uh, out of the 10 weight classes, you did mention that between 7 to 16 girls are in bracket. There are the upper weight class where the numbers are low, where yes. at each region you may have one or two girls. Yes. So that, that is the one exception. Um, and, it, and it's the same thing that you see with the boys, right? I mean, uh, the upper weight classes are just hard to fill. Um, so what we're looking at is in, in those cases, uh, you know, basically girls just have to make weight at those regions to qualify for the state tournament. We'll probably run around Robin at the state tournament in order to, to, to qualify or to, to determine our placers there. One, to, to give those girls a little bit more mat time instead of just one match. I've need all day. Um, but, uh, um, again, we want to get the true placers there. And so we might have to look at the end of this year to see if we have that 215-pound weight classes actually the right place so may have to change the weight classes to adjust them a little bit but right now i'll be honest uh, we feel pretty good with our 10 it's just maybe a matter of because uh, when you look at it uh in track wrestling we actually have more than those girls that are certified for that weight they just for whatever reason didn't make it to the whole season okay uh a couple questions uh Uniforms or singlets for the girls. Uh, there are different styles: two-piece style, single-piece style. Girls, uh, boys cut, girls cut. What's the regulation going to be on those? So um, we've got to look at that a little bit as well. Unfortunately, the National Federation of High School State Associations doesn't have a. Uh, Rules. The NFHS doesn't have rules right now for girls wrestling. Um, so when you look at the states that do offer wrestling, there's no standard weight classes. There's no standard uh, rule for things such as hair and, and, and hair coverings, um, and, and there's no standard for uniforms. Other, the NFHS does have rules for the boys, where it does talk about uh, the girls wrestling uh, when the boys what their uniforms should look like. We'll probably modify and use some of those rules uh, where if they're wearing a singlet, we're gonna ask that it be a girl's cut singlet, which is actually a little bit closer in the uh, <coughs> to the armpit than the boys is. Uh, so it's probably about three to four inches higher uh, in the underarm. Um, and obviously the alternate uniform for the boys, uh, the, the fighter shorts, fighter style shorts that are, that are manufactured specifically for wrestling or the uh, tight shorts, uh, spandex tight shorts, and a compression shirt, or a singlet underneath those will also be um, authorized uniforms. Um, we also understand school budgets. So, you know, until, uh, there, there might be a, a three or four year grace period on, on them uh, schools using male singlets until they have the budget to be able to, to buy uniforms for With them. the uh, male singlets, uh is the requirement going to be that they wear a compression type shirt underneath? That's something that we'll definitely look at. You know, we, we want to make sure that uh, uh, modesty requirements that, that uh, society puts on us are, are, are followed. Um, you know, uh, but at the same time, we also want our girls to be comfortable. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at some of those things. The other question is uh, you mentioned the uh, hair rule um, national federation high school association has a standard hair rule for the boys with the hair net covering un underneath and attached to the headgear yes, sir. Uh, is that something that's going to be required uh, i've heard talk of uh, different requirements for the girls so we made mid-season we made a, a determination which in a pilot program you get some some luxury and flexibility right in order to to find rules that make sense and implement them as you go along. Um, so we sent out a, a, an email to all teams, all the head coaches and the athletic directors that we would follow uh, Texas's um, guidelines around hair for, for women. And that's uh, a ponytail, um, which is held by a soft, uh, non-abrasive hair tie, uh, can be used if that ponytail did not extend beyond the uh, collar of a shirt, where a collar of a shirt would be. So from that standpoint, we're basically following the boys' guideline 
around length of hair. It's provided that that hair is in a ponytail and you use a non-abrasive hair tie. If that's the case, girls don't have to wear the hairnet attached to a headgear. If their hair is too long or they decide they're going to wear it in braids or something else of that nature, uh, because it has to be loose. It can't be a braided ponytail or anything like that line. Um, if, if it's just loose hair and a ponytail, they, they don't have to wear that um, hairnet. But most of the girls that you see around are wearing braids, and so they're wearing that, that uh, hairnet that's attached uh, firmly to the headgear. And, and we'll probably look at that as well. I know that there's talk amongst the NFHS, particularly after uh, social media was abuzz with the uh, incident in New Jersey, uh, about um, doing some common sense around that particular rule, even on the voice side. Okay. Yeah, I saw that video, and there was a lot of talk. So, But uh, also on the girls' side, uh, this is great opportunity for the girls, uh, especially... Uh, the ones that, that want to move on and wrestle in college because now there's over 40 colleges that have wrestling. Uh, the one last question I have, would uh, the Colorado girls team still be folk style or would it transition to the uh, freestyle that is uh, uh, done in college? Uh, we've got no interest in, in, in going to freestyle at the high school level. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, a lot of good reasons. One, um, coaching staffs might not understand the, the freestyle rules. There's a, a lot of differences now in freestyle, and those rules have changed quite a bit recently. Um, and they've changed more quickly, I guess, in folk, folk style. Though. So the other thing is, is we have a very good base of officials for folk style throughout the state. That base does not exist for us throughout the state. For, for freestyle, there are a lot of officials, but they're concentrated mainly in one area, uh, maybe two areas. Um, the other thing is, is that when you look at the other states that are offering girls wrestling, they're all doing folk style as well, and and that would take away opportunities if we went to, to freestyle for our girls to go to the other states and and be able to compete. Um, at other states without having to learn a whole new set of rules and then follow a whole different set of standards. I okay. uh, appreciate your time, Ernie. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, this is Inside Colorado with uh, Assistant Director Ernie DeHero. Uh Thank you again. All right. Thanks, so.